Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. <laughs> Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the Sabbath that's coming, for the blessings of this past week, the things that you have taught us, that you've shown us about ourselves. And we are thankful, Lord, that you always watch over us, and that even the trials that come to us are for our blessing. And so we come before you to study together. We ask for your Holy Spirit to guide and direct our minds, to teach us individually, to bring a conviction and an understanding of your word that we may be a light to others. We are very thankful, Lord, for the things that, that we are able to see happening in this world that are the signs of Christ's approaching and we pray Lord that we can understand them and that we can give the trumpet a certain sound that we can warn those who need to know of you please be with those who are struggling in various ways and be with this movement as we seek your presence as we seek your face be with us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, good evening. And it's not Sabbath here yet, but uh, I know sometimes it's Sabbath for others. And uh, we always receive such a blessing studying together on the Sabbath. Now, I'm going to address a comment that was on um, one of the videos. And I did address the comment on the video itself. So this was the video from last Friday. And uh, we're going to look at each of these, these arguments. And I've tried to understand them, um, what the person's understanding about what it is I'm saying. And it seems to me, and we'll see as we read through it, that there's a misunderstanding here, which can happen. People cannot understand one another. You know, trying to understand why the misunderstanding occurs maybe is, is a little bit beyond our ability in that we can't always know what goes on in other people's minds or hearts unless they tell us. And, um, you know, we try to be as clear as we can, but even when we try to be as clear as we can, there can be other things that occur that affect a person's ability to understand what's being said. And it may be that we aren't always as clear as we think. So, you know, I invite everyone who's here this evening, hopefully some more people show up um, in this study. I hadn't sent out a regular invitation because we're planning something tomorrow and I, I don't have enough information yet to send out the invitation. So I just sent out the fact that this study is going to begin in 10 minutes. And um, so hopefully people remember, but I know it gets hard, a bit hard on Friday evenings. So these comments are, and so, uh, you know, I probably could break them down a little bit more. Uh, it's just a block paragraph. But the person says, I've never heard that there is always an eighth whenever there is a 4-3 combination. And if so, that should be established in scripture and not just stated. Now, um, so I'm asking people to to help as we go through this what would we argue or what would we say to this objection can we ha, can we establish that in a 4-3 combination uh, that there is an eighth so an example of a 4-3 combination would be what what would what, what would be an example of a 4-3 combination Anybody know what we're talking about? So if we look at something like the ch seven churches, is it in a 4-3 combination? Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Can we say that that's a 4-3 combination? Anybody with thoughts on that?
What about the seven trumpets? So we're going to have the first four trumpets address what history? Roman. Okay, so the first four trumpets are going to deal with the fall of the Roman Empire. So that would be pagan Rome, correct? Right. Okay. Now what about uh, the last three trumpets? Are they separate from the first four? Okay, so we're going to have, uh, if we're dealing with the trumpets, we're going to be dealing with uh, the first, second, and third, uh, or not, first, second, and third woes, and the first woe is going to happen under the, the fifth trumpet, and the second woe under the sixth trumpet, and the third woe under the seventh trumpet. So these would be four, three combinations. Now, is there an eighth? In either the, the seven churches or the seven trumpets? Can you repeat that for me? You said is there something that I didn't think? Okay, Chris, is that you talking? Because it's a little distorted. Okay, yeah, because you sound like you're about 40 years younger and and very high-pitched and uh, a little bit distorted. I'm not sure why. So I can't quite grasp what you're saying. Well, I just was asking you to repeat your question. Okay, so the question has to do with the four three combinations, which have been well-established in Scripture. And I'm always asking, can we say that there is an eighth after the seven. So, for instance, Aran put in his comments regarding the churches that the eighth church is a repeat of Ephesus. Now, in, in some ways, the eighth church is also a repeat of Philadelphia. But the question is, what is the eighth? Why do we talk about an eighth at all? We have the seven churches, we have the seven seals, we have the seven trumpets. And and they're, they're grouped in a 4-3 combination. Um, so the question is, why would we say that there is always an eighth? Because what is an eighth? What is it representing as a symbol? I thought it was like a repeat. Okay, a repeat. Well, like a resurrection. So when we have this number eight, so I'm going to go to this... Um, paper we were looking at last week, the Palmoni paper. And, and in this paper, it's going to talk about the number eight. And let me see if I can get back. Now, they call it the dominical number. So this is a non-Adventist. He's actually a, um, I think he's a Presbyterian, but, um, and this was written in 1863. So, you know, we can't say that everything he says is correct, but he does bring out some arguments that we would agree with in how we are using numbers. And so he's going to say the great eras of the world before the flood and of the Levitical dispensation being both of the same length and both introductory to an era of new life. May not the number eight, the numerical symbol of the idea of the re resurrection, be a measure or factor of the duration of those periods? So he looks at these periods of time, and he can see that they're divisible by eight, um, which to me is, is not insignificant, 
it's not generally the most important thing about the number eight. Um, but we know that the number eight in its uh, symbolism has to do with the resurrection. And so it's interesting that, for instance, the 1656 years, the period of the flood, which is going to have eight persons saved at the end, is going to be divisible by eight. And, and it produces a number which is 207, 207 times eight. And that number also becomes significant as well. But he has a significant, which I don't really think is that significant, but it, it does come into play in other periods of time. Now, um, so he talks about that. He says, one word, however, touching the meaning which we assume for this number eight, Dr. Wordsworth says in his notes in the New Testament, as the number seven is the sabbatical number, the number of rest in Holy Scripture, so eight may be called the dominical. Seven is expressive of rest in Christ. Eight is expressive of resurrection to new life and glory to him. Now, this fact that Christ is resurrected on the eighth day, uh, Louis F. Weir, we're going to look at his paper, he addresses this, and, and he says what, what the Catholic Church does is they take what is symbolic or figurative and they try to make it literal. That is, they want to have Sunday as the Sabbath being the eighth day of every week. And so that would not be um, correct. It would be a misapplication of a symbol to make it something literal. Um, now, the eighth day is the day of circumcision, so we know that to be a fact, and the sy symbol, symbol of the circumcision also applies to baptism, and in baptism you die, are buried in the water, and are resurrected. So we can see that the resurrection symbolizes this. And and then you take the name of Jesus, if rendered into numerals corresponding to its Greek letters, is 10, 8, 200, 70, 40, and 20, 200, 400 and 200, which being added up is 888, the opposite of the famous 666, the number of the beast. So he goes through and explains a number of his uh, applications of this number 8. Noah's age is 8 times 75, which last number also is 5 times 15, that 120. Uh, the suspended judgment is 8 times 15. And, of course, 8 times 15 would be significant for what reason? So it's 120, but it's also the number of... Uh, the midnight cry and we know that the midnight cry occurs on the first day of the fifth month and that's going to be symbol symbolizing 120 days and it's going to be August 15th so 8 times 15 equals 120 and then you're going to have 70 days further of course to the day of atonement so you have this 120 and the 70 so it's interesting that somebody Back in 1863, in a book that uh, his preface is dated June 9th, 1863, and we know the significance of June 9th is it marks when this movement, the dividing line from when we are time setting to when we openly say that we are time setting, of course, in a qualified sense, but that happened in this movement on June 9th, 2018. So the fact that you have this June 9th 1863, an important date, um, 1863, but also this date in a number in a book called Palmoni, I think is significant. Okay, so um, I'll just do that this way. So he's going to go through dealing with some of these other numbers and, and trying to explain them. And I, I guess what I could do is just do it this way. Um, he's going to deal with 15. The number 8 is more strikely, striking because it is precisely what we naturally might expect. Um, let me see what else does he say. 
dealing with Passover and Purim. They have the number eight associated multiples of eight. I'm going to look at all of his arguments about eight. Um, you know, the eight hundreds, eight tens, and eight ones. So he addresses that. Okay, so I'm going to leave that paper. And we're going to go to this other paper. Now, this is the paper by Lewis F. Weir. Now, here, Lewis F. Weir talks about the number eight as well. And, of course, he focuses upon the idea that it's it's of the resurrection. And he quotes here uh, Reverend E.W. Bullinger, Doctor of Divinity, uh, who wrote this. The use and significance of the number eight in Scripture is seen to recur in marvelous exactitude. It may indeed be said that eight is the dominical number for everywhere it has to do with the Lord. It is the number of his name, Jesus, 888. And that's from a book called Number in Scripture, page 203. Other dominical names of Jesus are marked by gematria and stamped with the number eight as a factor. So Christ is 1480, which is eight times 185. Lord is eight times 100. Our Lord is seven, uh, eight times 221. Savior is eight times 22. Emmanuel is eight times eight times eight times 50, which is interesting. Um, Messiah is 656, eight times 82. Son is 880, eight times 10. After stating that the number 13 or its multiple is the number of rebellion, the same writer says these results may be stated briefly. While the names of the Lord's people are multiples of eight, while the names of those who apostatized or rebelled or were in any sense his enemies are multiples of 13. And so there's three in the Old Testament, three in the Gospels, two in Acts 9 and 20, uh, which equal eight. Eight songs uh, in the Old Testament outside the Psalms. Now, some of these uh, I find a little bit subjective. Um, not all of them, but some of them. So there's just all of these things dealing with the number eight that he addresses. Elsewhere, I've shown that the whole of the experience of Israel were typical of the experiences of spiritual Israel. This, of course, is what is explicitly taught in 1 Corinthians 10, 6, margin 11. Um, margin, etc. Their passage across the Jordan has long been seen as a symbol of the death, of death, the dividing line between the wilderness journey and the entrance into the everlasting canyon, which we know depends upon the resurrection at the second coming of Christ. The eighth miracle was the dividing of the Jordan, after which he was translated to heaven. Elijah, as we have shown, is typical of the people who preach the closing message of God and who will live till the coming of the Lord, before God's dear saints are taken to glory, and the Jordan must first be divided. The power of death must be broken, and then will follow the entrance into Canaan's fair land to ever be with the Lord. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles in the old typical economy was the only feast which was kept eight days. The eighth is distinguished from the seventh. As we all know, the Feast of Tabernacles typifies the gathering of all the saved in the New Jerusalem after the world's harvest has been reaped. Also in the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. Thus in the typical service, the first and eighth days, which reoccurring annually would come on different days of the week, of the Feast of Tabernacles were Sabbaths. They were not typical of the first day of every week, for they were entirely independent of and bore no relation to the weekly cycle. The antitype of this typical service belongs to the new world after the harvest, which is reaped at the end of the world. The eighth day Feast of Tabernacles will have its fuller application when sin has been entirely banished, as it will be at the end of the millennium, and the new world begun at the commencement of the eighth millennium from creation. So let's just explore this idea a little bit more dealing with the number eight. So where would we first see the number eight as a symbol of the resurrection based on what we just read here?
Flo Dwight. So maybe you can answer this question I just asked. Um, so we're looking at the number eight, and we had just read, this is from Lewis F. Weir's book, Christ Conquers, and he's in the number eight. He dealt with the Feast of Tabernacles, and now he's asking, or he's commenting on the fact that the eighth millennium ends at the end of 7,000 years from creation. And the question I'm asking is, where would we first see the idea that eighth is the symbol of the resurrection? So he's using it here at the resurrection of the right of the, of the righteous in the new earth. So they're going to be resurrected beforehand, but now they're going to be after the thousand years. They're going to be in this new earth. So that's going to be the eighth millennium from creation that that begins. So if we're going to deal with the number eight as a symbol of a resurrection, where would we first find this? When we have to say with Christ's resurrection? Okay, well, we have Christ's resurrection, which is the basis of it. We do see it in circumcisions on the eighth day. We also have eight people who were saved in the ark. And would that be a symbol of death, burial, and resurrection being in the flood? It could be, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, now, what about the week itself? So we have seven days of creation. Well, first six where God actively creates. The seventh where he rests. How do we connect that to the millennium? Well, if we take what Peter had to say, a day unto God is as a thousand years. Okay. So so we can we can say that in that weekly cycle. There is a renewal every week, and that renewal points to the renewal that's going to happen after 7,000 years that sin exists. Can we say that? I would have to say that's possible. Okay. Yeah. So... I mean, we have all kinds of examples. We've looked at them, the circumcision, of course, Christ's name, um, Jesus being 888 in Greek, and that the titles of the Lord um, also being divisible by eight. So you missed that part. Um, but this was the question. So we're going to go back to the original question that we were asking. We were looking at some comments, a comment on the video from last Friday. And the first comment was, I've never heard that there is always an eighth whenever there's a 4-3 combination. And if so, that should be established in Scripture and not just stated. So we know that there are seven churches. There's seven trumpets. There's seven seals. There's seven thunders. There's seven way marks in Millerite history. Um, but the question is, is there always an eighth? And if there is, what is the eighth so about the churches for instance we have ephesus smyrna pergamus thyatira which are grouped as the first four churches and then we have the last three and in that last three it, there's addressed a reform line so you have the time of the end and then you're going to have sardis philadelphia and laodicea and Iran commented on the fact that um, we have the eighth church is a repeat of Ephesus. And we can say that. We can also say it's a repeat of Philadelphia. Both would be correct because they're symbols. And certain aspects of the eighth is just coming back around again to the first. But the question is, is there always an eighth? And what does the eighth mean in the context of a 4-3 combination? 
can we say that after we have Laodicea, we have another church arise? That's the eighth. Can we say that? That there isn't just seven churches. I believe this point was being addressed by Elder Jeff quite a bit. Yeah. Because how can you end with a church that is in, ab in such abject failure? Mm -hmm. So you have to have an eighth. Right. Now, when we deal with it of the seven, um, that is their characteristics or symbolic aspects that show that this church has is a continuation of something. So to me, of the seven doesn't mean one of the seven. It just means that it's it has the same characteristics. It's a continuation or a repeat of history. That is the eighth to me is a repeat of history. So when we look at Millerite history, for instance, and we have um it's not necessarily what we'd call a 4-3 combination. But you're going to have the, the first angel's message, which arrives and is formalized and empowered. And then the second angel's message arrives and formalized as in empowered. And then the third angel's message arrives. We know that that's not the end. We know that we need to have the other angel, which happens to be one of the angels of Millerite history, that is the second angel that arrives in Revelation 18. And so we would have to say that that marks the eighth. So the eighth is simply a repeat of history. At least that's how I've understood it. Now there's other things about the eighth. One is we have Christ is the true eighth. We would look at the eighth in Revelation 17 as a counterfeit. So uh, they go on to say, um, even so, so if they, they conceded the idea that there is an eighth that always follows a 4-3 combination or always follows a seventh, uh, the eighth you're alluding to is a completely different entity from the preceding seven, isn't it? In other words, not of the seven. Now, this comes from a misunderstanding which we see at the end. Um, they say, um, is it not confusion to try and establish that Christ is the eighth king of that beastly system described in Revelation 17? Now, of course, that's not something we ever said. Uh, that would be wrong. So it seems that when they're talking about uh, a completely different entity that they are assuming or, or understand that we're trying to argue from Christ being the eighth king of Judah, that he must also be the eighth head of Revelation 17. And of course, that would not follow. So if the beast of Revelation 17 is a counterfeit, if there is an eighth, doesn't it mean that in the thing that it's counterfeiting, there is an eighth? Can you restate that, please? So if the, if the thing that is the counterfeit, the seven kings of Revelation 17, have an eighth, wouldn't that imply that the original that's being counterfeited must also have an eighth? Yes. Right. So, so we know that we have to look for the eighth in the original. And we can see that the original is Christ because he's the true eighth, because if the counterfeit is counterfeiting something that's, that's good, it's a counterfeit of the true, then the true Christ must be the eighth. And if we're going to look at a line of kings where we have seven and there is an eighth, and that eighth is Christ, which 
the beast of Revelation 17 is counterfeiting. It has to be the last seven kings of Judah, which we already established in this movement as being this parallel. So we know that Satan is counterfeiting the true. So we need to know what the true is that he's counterfeiting. Now, we already had lined up the kings of Medo-Persia as being a parallel with the kings of Judah, correct? I would agree. So in their next comment, they say, the sequence of Judah's seven last kings does not parallel the seven kings of Revelation 17. But we know that um, Colin is paralleling the seven kings of Revelation 17 with the seven kings of Medo-Persia. And we already parallel the seven kings of Medo-Persia with the seven kings of Judah. So that as the first seven kings of Medo-Persia, or of Persia itself, are paralleled with the, the last seven kings of Judah. So if that's the case, we would have to argue that the sequence of Judah's last seven kings must parallel the seven kings of Revelation 17, if we are going to parallel the seven kings of Revelation 17 with the seven kings of Persia. Correct? Agreed. There's no way that you could say that the seven kings of Judah are parallel to the seven kings of Persia, but and that the seven kings of Revelation 17 are parallel to the kings of Persia, but not parallel to the kings of Judah. So it, it the argument doesn't make any sense to me because we know that we've already made the parallel. Now we, we could argue that, that that parallel shouldn't have been made. So we could say that Jeff was wrong when he took all of these seven kings both the last seven kings of northern Israel and the last seven kings of Judah and also the seven kings in Roman history, or at least paralleled in the way that we are paralleling the emperors and also the presidents of the United States, though we don't have seven there, but we're, we're paralleling that history with the kings of Persia. So that's what Colin is doing is he's saying we need to extend that to there to be seven and also an eighth. And if we're paralleling the kings of, of the United States, the presidents of the United States with the heads of, of Revelation 17, that is if we're making a parallel between the seven kings of Revelation 17 and the presidents of the United States, and we're arguing that there is an eighth in the presidents of the United States, would we not also have to accept that there is the eighth in 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 the kings of me of the kings of Persia? Would we would we have to say that there also must be an eighth in that seven? That I'm going to have to consider. I've not thought about that before. Okay. I would say that we would have to have an eighth and we would need to understand what that is. And, and how that arises. Now, when it came to the kings of Judah, if we remember, it begins with um, Manasseh and it begins with Manasseh because that's the beginning of the 2520 for Judah. And we're going to mark Manasseh, where a captivity occurs, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. Each one of these are the four seven times. But we're going to have uh, some other kings, Josiah and um, Jehoahaz and Ammon. Those three kings are not going to be marked in the progressive destruction of four that comes from Leviticus 26. So there's not a captivity in the time of, of Ammon. There's not a captivity in the time of 
Josiah. There's not a captivity in the time of um, Jehoahaz, right? At least not one that's marked by Leviticus 26. Nobody marks uh, Jehoahaz as a captivity. Right? So we, we understand Ellen White marks them out. Um, most commentators would mark them out. They would all note those four events, and especially the last three, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. So, so we have seven kings, but we have four main waymarks that are marked. And, and then we're going to have under Zedekiah, the end of the kingship of Judah, and it's going to be taken over by Babylon. And that, that really actually happens um, at the end of Jehoiachin's reign. And we looked at, at the genealogy of Christ, and we know that Christ is not going to descend from Zedekiah because he has no heirs. And, but he is going to descend from Jehoiachin. So in the time of Babylon, the kingship ends, and then it's going to be overturned to Medo-Persia, then overturned to Greece, then overturned to Rome. And then Christ is going to set up his kingdom in the time of Rome. Now that happens in a sense when he enters as a king into heaven. But for this earth, it's going to happen when he takes up this kingdom after the work of the day of Tom, after his work of a priest is completed. Then he will come as a conquering king, what we call the second coming. So, so this idea that there is seven and then there is eight is definitely clear in the kings of Judah and that Christ is the eighth. Now, when it comes to this riddle, so, and she quotes here, of the seven, one of the things we have noted is that it's not one of the seven. That is, the verse does not say that the eighth is one of the seven. It says that the eighth is of the seven. Now, what do we think of that? What's the significance of the eighth being of the seven? Not one of the seven. Is that significant? Well, <clears throat> what if the eighth is like the seventh? Okay. So it's, well, being of the seven means that it's of the nature. So that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So when a son is of his father, he's a descended from his father. He is not his father. He's not any of his ancestors, even though they, they preceded him. Uh, but he can be of them, right? That's what of means. Now, the question is, why have we always read that it is one of the seven? Why do you think we have done that? Because that's a cursorly way of approaching it. Okay. Now, I think part of it has to do with when we look at Revelation 17, so let's go there again, because we're trying to answer her questions. And we know in Revelation 17 that um, we have this woman riding a beast, fornicating with this beast. It's mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. And she's on this beast. Now, these heads, the way that the pioneers understood them, is they were the seven forms of Roman government. One of those heads was the papal form of Roman government. Now, this movement has understood um, that the seven heads represent Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan, Rome, papal, the United States, and the UN. That's the way that we've understood these seven heads in this order. And we've taken this riddle where it says, um, starting in verse 9, here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Now, the way the pioneers understood this is that um, when the question is being asked and answered, 
we must look at it from the perspective of when John is writing. That is, he's seeing things in the future, but he's being talked to in the present. And so they would say, well, the five that are fallen are five forms of Roman government. The sixth is the empirical form. So they have emperors. And then the seventh will be the papal form. And then the eighth is the image of the beast. That is, it's the resurrection of this papal form of government, which is accomplished by the United States. So that's the way that the pioneers would understand that. But with our understanding of the Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal, we would take this as referring to the end of the 1260, that, that when it says five are fallen and one is, that we must take that from that period of time, the time in when the United States is rising into power. Now, we also then, in the application that Colin is making, he would have to argue that we also must apply it to our time in this way. Five are fallen. So who are the five that are fallen? According to Colin. Because they're going to be presidents of the United States. Reagan Bush, Clinton, Bush the second, Obama, and I think he's trying to add in Trump now. Yeah, so so he's going to put Trump, so he's going to put Trump, and then he's going to put Biden, and then he's going to put Trump again. So Trump's going to be the eighth. So the five are fallen would be Reagan, Bush one, um, Clinton, Bush two, and Obama. The one that is would be Trump. There's going to be the seventh that's going to come, and that would be Biden. Now, you know, and this is just a simplification of this, but then we would have to have Trump rise again. So he's saying he's going to be one of the seven. Now, if we deal with something like the papal form of government that uh, the pioneers are using, we, we would then see that they're not necessarily saying it's, it's the papacy has to be of the seven, right? So they're not arguing um, that it has to be the pope that's going to be the eighth. They're arguing that it's going to be this image of the beast that's going to be the eighth. And it's of the seven, that it is a form of government that exists in, in Rome. And that is the form that they're looking at is republicanism. So the pioneers view, look at republicanism as being the characteristic of this eighth power. But of course, it's a republicanism that's in apostasy. Now, I have some problems with their interpretation, and, and we know that they didn't understand everything completely, and that their interpretation changed over time as they moved through history. That is, they came to understand it a little bit differently. But the view they did not hold is that the seven heads represent Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, etc., which we do hold to that view. And when we look at the pioneer's view, we can argue that they are correct, that there is a consistency, though, with their argument, but their consistency is looking at it from the perspective of Ellen White's history. When we're looking at Revelation 17, we're looking at it from the perspective of a repeat of history. Are we not? Agreed. Okay. And, and so we could say that both views are correct, but that in order to understand the view that we are now, the application we're now making, we need to understand both views to give us enough information that we can come to a conclusion. So even though they have a different point in which they're marking, we can also see that we must 
be marking it differently as well. And that we would have to look at this as a prophecy in the time of Trump in order for there to be five that are fallen and one is. Right? Because that's a new application. When we apply it to the presidents of the United States, we must say that we're looking at this in the time of Trump. Now, what would be the basis? Now, it says my internet connection is unstable. So hopefully I'm, I'm not getting cut off. But if we're going to apply it to the time of, of, of in which we're living and we're going to say five are fallen and one is, what would be the basis that we could put that in the time of Trump's presidency and that another is not yet come? You understand the question? Do you see that we have to put it in a specific time if we're going to apply the riddle to the present? Okay, but we have it. We have one other issue with this. Yeah. Okay. Are we not talking about this also being the time in which the third angel's message is to be given? Okay. Um, yes. So, so let's just let's just leave that apart for now. Let's leave out the problem. Right. Just what I'm asking is if we're going to make an application to the present and we're going to say five are fallen, we're going to talk about the presidents of the United States, and one is, if we're going to make an application, that means we'd have to look at the one is, that is, we'd have to be in interpreting this in the time of the one that is, right? I would agree. We couldn't look at this as as being um, a message when the one that is already come is is there. Right? Because it's talking about the one that is. And so the question is, what basis would we have to say, if we're making an application to the present, that we can take the one is as being Trump? That five are fallen. So what would place us in the time of the one that is, that in the time of Trump. So we're, this is just a hypothetical, but but we've done this already. But what would be the basis of doing so? Because we couldn't have interpreted this five or fallen, you know, in the time of George Bush the first, right? We Correct. Have done, right. So that means we'd have to say we're making an application and we're, we're, we're applying that one is. That means when we're looking at this, we have to say that Trump is the president. And, and what would be the reason for doing that? And, and I think there's a good reason that we can do that. So what is it about the time of Trump that allows us to place this prophecy to interpret this prophecy as the one that is, is Trump. Now we're looking at it now, the Trump's no longer, but if we're gonna look at this and we're gonna make an application, could we have made an application of this? Or must we make an application of this if we're gonna make an application in our time to the time when Trump is reigning? And that we have to tie this in some way with a message that that message is speaking to us or to those who are in the time of Trump and not those who are after the time of Trump. Now, we could just argue we have the time of the end, right? We have these, these presidents and we're just going to count them. And, and we have the same thing that Odilia was doing with the, the emperors. So we're just going to count them. And we're going to count them in the time we're going to start with with Reagan, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, um, Bush the second, and Obama, right? So those are the five that are following. Okay, let's let's go back to one of my charts here. Um, so you can see the problem, hopefully, that it's um, that we have to be able to establish this some way. 
that we can't just simply um, take this riddle and not place it back into the proper time. Now I'm going to go back, back, back here. Let me see. I'll find Trump. This will be a better way to do it. Um, maybe I, I'll use instead, I'll use uh, Reagan. Because then I can find it easier. Too many Trumps. Okay, so we looked at this chart before. And we can see that we have uh, the kings of Persia, and there's seven of them. And, and we're going to start, of course, with Cyrus. So in a sense, you know, you, Darius the Mede does not count. Right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're counting from Cyrus. Why do we count from Cyrus? Because he was the son of the Persians and not of the Medes. Okay, right. So these are the kings of Persia. So we're going to start with Cyrus, not with Darius. Now, we have lined up these two times of the ends, right? So we did the three decrees and the three angels' messages and the repeat of the three angels' messages. We've lined them all up. And then we know that when we're going to count then, why would we count Reagan as one, Bush as two, Clinton as three, Bush the second as four, and Obama as five, and Trump as six? Why would we do that? Because we're not counting the kings of Persia that way. So can we count them starting at Reagan? I think that's the way we've been doing it for, for quite a while now. Can okay. we? Yes. Okay, so we could start at Reagan, but when we do that, we have to recognize that we're doing something different than we were with the kings of Persia. That is, we're counting from a different person that we're lining up with this history. Now, we know, of course, in Daniel chapter 11, verse 1 to 3, when it talks about three are yet to stand up in Persia, that's going to be Cambyses, Falsmertus, and Darius, and then Xerxes is going to be the fourth. So, depends how you're counting. But... When we counted this, we weren't counting seven presidents. So Jeff wasn't looking for um, a sixth and a seventh. Even though he was dealing with these presidents of the United States, he was looking at Trump as the last president of the United States. So Trump would end up being the sixth if you're going to count Reagan as the first. And then you would have a seventh. Now, in this case, with the kings of Persia, we're going to see Art Artabanus is the sixth, and then Artaxerxes is the seventh. But we need to note that we're counting these things differently. Now, we don't have an application of the kings of Persia where we say five are fallen, one is, and one is yet to come. Now, when he continues, he must continue a short space. And then there's going to be an eighth. We, you know, we don't make that application to the kings of Persia. Right? So it doesn't mean in every situation that we can take when there's seven that five are going to be fallen, one is. So we know that it's only when it's counterfeiting something. Right? That is that there's a certain parallel. So I, I'm arguing that we can do this. We can go, the five are fallen are Reagan to Obama, and that the one that is has to be Trump. Now, we have Trump as the one that is. Um, so when we look at uh, the is, he's going to be the sixth in that count. So this shows five, but we're going to count him as six. So the seventh is going to be the last one. So if, if the seventh is the last of, of them, because there's the one that is and the one that's yet to come, 
How would we understand that in relation to Biden? If Trump is the last president of the United States, he's the 45th president, and then we have Biden is the seventh. So, you know, I could probably move these numbers over. Don't want to confuse you. So maybe I'll, I'll bring it up this way. Um, because um, I have Collins diagram here somewhere. So oh, I'm having trouble finding it. Oh, it might be. Oh, I know why. It's in a different folder. Sorry about that. Um, here it is. Whoops, that's not it. Um, that's the wrong file. Hmm. Must be in here. Ah, here it is. Okay, so I'll share that screen instead. But in this chart that's before us right now, yeah. what if Biden is the same as Artabanus? Okay, so so in that here, I gotta go back because I ended up I was already I'm sorry. in the process of sharing this. Okay, so you're saying that by Biden lines up with Artabanus. I'm asking the what if. Okay, what if? What, now, what if, if we know about Artabanus? Well, no, that would make Biden the one that is, and then one that is yet to come. I mean, I see your point, because yeah. what, what you're trying to do is you're trying to establish that in this, in this way of looking at it, that Trump would be the sixth, Biden would be the seventh, and then you would have the eighth having the power like the others. Okay. Yeah, so now here's what, what Colin did. So he had uh, Reagan as the first, so he's not lining them up the same way with the kings of Persia as we would have. So he's lining Reagan up with a king of the Medes. And then he's going to have um, Donald Trump being the sixth, so five or fallen one is. He's also the fourth, right, because he's the fourth from Daniel chapter 11, verse 1 to 3. And then Joe Biden becomes the seventh. And then that's the Battle of Raffia. That's January 6, 2021. And then we're going to have Paneum, which he places as being connected with the midterm elections uh, coming up this year. So that's going to be Paneum. And I actually would agree with him. But I just don't agree that Trump is the one that replaces it. That is, we can look that there's a Rafi and a Paneum connected with the King of the South and then the King of the North winning. It just doesn't need to be Trump. And actually, it can't be Trump. But, but it's a whole other issue. Now, he's also lining it up with the National Sunday Law, which I don't think we're going to see the National Sunday Law yet. Um, because we're in a typical line still. But, but the point is we need to realize that we're counting differently in order to do this. But I'm arguing that we can do this 
in that I believe that the one that is is Trump and that we're putting it into a specific point in our history in understanding Revelation 17. And, and I'm asking what would be the basis for doing that? Why could we take the history of Trump and apply it to our time as being the one that five or fallen one is? If we look at this history, Revelation 7, or not this history, this prophecy, these verses, um, one of the verses that we have here that we've recognized is Revelation 17, 11. The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. And we know 17 times 11 is 187. So why, can we, why would we mark this verse as referring to our history? Why can we take this then, based on the symbolism here? Can we apply this to our history? Can we apply it to the July 18th, 2020 prediction in this specific way? I think we have to. Yeah, I, I think we do, right? So, so we can say that this applied when it was originally written to five or fallen one is, to the forms of Roman government. And we can take this and place it in 1798, where we have, and, and we also, one of the things that we have to do there is we have to recognize that there is a time of the end um, that is being addressed in the book of Revelation, which we've never really done. Um, that there's a time of the end that refers to the destruction of Jerusalem, that that's also the time of the end. We haven't really well established it, dealing with the, with the emperors. We haven't dealt with the line of the emperors completely. Odilio's dealt with it some. Blessings has dealt with it some. But this movement as a whole hasn't really addressed this yet. So, and I think it's an important point. We can see then that the, in a repeat of history, we can go back to the other history. We can take our line and we can say that in our line, we're in a certain point in those lines and that that line brought us to July 18, 2020. And that when we're making an application of this, we don't look at where we are today. We look at where we were when this became relevant or evident. And that's going to be in 2020 when Trump is president. And specifically, it's about July 18th. So July 18th gives us a repeat of history that we have to recognize. And, and so we have to say that if five are fallen, it has to be Reagan, Bush the first, Clinton and Bush the second, and Obama. Those have to be the five that have fallen. And the one is, has to be Trump. Now, we know that there's a beast that was and is not. Even he is the eighth. And so one of the things that it says about this eighth is it's not, it's not one of the seven, right? Uh, right. it, it just depends what you mean. I'm not saying it very well. But one thing we can say about this, this is the beast, right? Is the beast that was and is not. What is the beast? The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. What is the beast? What beast is refer being referred to here in Revelation 17, 11? The papacy. This is referring to the papacy. It would be referring to the beast of Revelation 13, correct? Right. Okay. So if the first beast is this beast, we can see that this beast doesn't have a woman riding it. 
It's being given its power from the dragon, which is the beast of Revelation 12, pa pagan Rome. And this beast is going to be papal Rome. So this beast is the papacy. Now the papacy receives a deadly wound, right? And then we have a second beast. Now the second beast is not the papacy. But what's the second be beast going to do? It's going to make an image of the beast, right? Correct. Now, if, if it makes an image of the beast, it, it can't be the beast itself, right? So we know it's not the beast. It's a different beast. And so the beast that was and is not can't be this beast. But it's going to make an image of the beast. And it's going to give power and life. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, right? That the image of the beast should both speak and live or speak and cause as many that would not worship the image of the beast should be killed, right? So it's going to speak which is with its legislative authority. So this, this beast that get, makes the image of the beast is the United States. And it's going to cause this beast to speak. Or this image of the beast to speak. So when we go to Revelation 17, and we have this beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. <coughs> wouldn't, isn't the papacy resurrected in the image of the beast? Because this is what Bates argues, is that the eighth represents this image of the beast, because it the <coughs> this one of the heads was wounded unto death, right? Received a deadly wound. But it's going to be resurrected. But it's going to be resurrected how? Does the papacy have to take over the world in order to be resurrected? Like itself, does the papacy no. have to do that? No. How is it resurrected then? In what form? In okay, the manner. Yeah. It, it, in the manner of the way that it had originally ruled. Okay, but it's going to be it's going to be it's going to be the United States that makes the image to the beast and causes the world to worship the beast and his image. It's going to be the one that places the mark on the right hands and the foreheads of those that, that receive the mark of the beast, right? Those are the those that worship the beast in his but image. Or it ruled with great authority. So yeah. in the image of the beast, the image is going to have to rule with great authority. Mm -hmm. But it's still going to be the United States. Because they're, the continue, ones that, please. because they're the ones that make the image to the beast, the image of the beast. And they're going to be the ones enforcing it. Now, we, we would say that they're the army of the, of the papacy, right? I mean, the papacy is at the head of this all along. But in Revelation 17, the woman is riding the beast. So the woman can't be one of the heads.
we, we know the Catholic Church is all behind this, but the Catholic Church isn't going to be ruling the world in a direct way. It doesn't take over the governments of the world in a direct way. It's going to use the governments of the world through the United States, through the United Nations, to bring about its ends. So how is it that an Adventist typically looks at the Sunday law? What are we, what are we often looking for? Where are we watching? At legislation. Okay. Now, so legislation in the United States? Yes. Okay. Now, are people often also looking at what the papacy is doing? Reading encyclicals and papal, you know, statements? Like, Not quite as much, but yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so we watch the papacy. But the enemy that is the one that's going to be the most deceptive is the United States itself. So one of the things that is going to happen, so and, and this is something we've been struggling with as Seventh-day Adventists for a long time, is how does the Sunday law come about? How is it, how is it done? And, and we know that um, the United States is going to be the one, so we look at this, it's going to speak like a dragon. And we know that the United States is uh, going to have it's some kind of religious law. So it's not going to be a secular law. And so we would look at it that it needs to be a, uh, we know that it's going to be the, the end of republicanism and Protestantism, because we know the Protestant horn fell in Millerite history and the Republican horn falls in our history. But we often just look at something like the Pope some, somehow becomes in charge, but yet it comes in a deceptive way that as many Adventists, when the Sunday law comes, will support it. And why will they support it? Will they recognize it as the Sunday law that we see in the Bible in the spirit of prophecy? Why would they not recognize the Sunday law? Is it just that and, and we're not saying just that they're liberal Adventists. Some of them would be conservative Adventists. Why is it that they would accept the Sunday law? Because it's not coming in the, for, in the way that they think it should. Okay, so it doesn't come in the way that they expect. Now, can we say that, that we are conservative? that we are more in sympathy with the policies of the Republican government, especially Trump's policies. Wouldn't we have more sympathy with Trump than we would with the Democrats? Very much. Okay. So if we have a government that comes in and seems to be, because we know what's being undermined, free speech, uh, individual rights, the constitution's being trampled upon. But the thing I find interesting is how people's loyalties change when it comes to politics. You know, here's an example. Um, three years ago, were, uh, was the left supportive of big pharma no not at all right they were really opposed to big pharma but where does the left stand now in relationship to big pharma in lockstep right okay now when you look at 
the the religious right in the United States were they big on free speech three years ago not always not always no would they believe in censorship it depended on what it was but at times yes yeah okay but now their views have completely changed people's views because they're not based upon correct principles can fluctuate that is what they believe at any given time can change because they're actuated by different principles than than truth and so people can take a quite a different stance depending what's happening around them many adventists will support a sunday law because they will see it as a move against immorality against the craziness that exists today but what is going to stop us from not supporting that type of a sunday law that that direction it won't appear as a sunday law at first and, and we saw it here you know in canada with the truckers would it may have made sense as a present truth person in this movement to support the political actions of the truckers even though we sympathize with their view of things no okay why not because we're not supposed to be involved politically okay what would be the danger of us taking funds the lord's funds and using it to support the truckers because we're helping church and state join together are we not okay and anybody else i mean i, I agree because don't we didn't we have sympathy with the truckers yeah there's sympathy but the, the point is as you were asking the question yeah could we take the funds that were committed to the lord to support the truckers and there the answer would be no because they're not of the temple while they're doing something that is commendable it's not so much in god's service yeah so, so i know many present truth adventists and even people in this movement who have supported the truckers so what's the problem what why 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 could we not recognize that's a problem or even standing up against the vaccine mandates the vaccine mandates aren't good but why would we not be involved in protests because that puts us in more of a political arena than in the, the arena that God would have us be in. That's turning to the right or turning to the left. Okay, so we know that the arena that God is having us in is the gospel. We, we use the gospel to convince. We don't use the power of the state. Now when the state power is against us, our natural human reaction is to rebel against it. We saw this in the time of Christ with uh, the zealots. What were the zealots doing in the time of Christ? People like Judas. They were looking for every way possible to throw the Romans out. Yeah, they wanted to overthrow the Roman government. Was the Roman government unjust in what it was doing? It was not favorable to the Jews. Right. And Jesus says, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. But now my kingdom is not from hence, right? Right. So we should be in that same stance. It doesn't matter that injustices are being done. But many Christians, many Adventists believe that we should seek justice in this world. Now, I'm going to go back to these comments. So I know we've kind of drifted off a little bit further from where I wanted to go. Um, and we're going to have to come to these in another study. 
uh, next week, but I'll go back to this. So the, we have these comments. Um, so we had read this about the sequence of Judah's last seven kings does not parallel the kings of Revelation 17. And scripture is not describing Judah or Israel in Old Testament times, but the beast and the woman who rides from her reception in Old Testament times to her demise in New Testament times or New Testament end times. But we know that there's always a parallel because how do we understand the present? Don't we compare it to the past? We understand it in the light of the past. Right. And so if there is something in the past, like the seven kings of Judah, it has to speak to the seven kings of Revelation 17. Even though it's not dealing with the same history, it has to be a parallel. And you can't say there's no comparison because there is a comparison. Now, the context of the last seven kings of Judah cannot be conflated with the context of Revelation 17. So, she, so they're saying the same thing. John states that five are fallen, one is, and one is yet to come. My math tells me that equals seven. John further tells us there is an eighth and that this eighth is of the seven. The seven already stated. Now, we know that doesn't mean one of the seven. It's of the seven. This is clearly describing a return to power by one of the previous seven. Now, I don't think that that would be correct. Why would we say that this describes a return to power of one of the previous seven? Is there any basis for making that claim? Because this is sort of the claim that Colin has. I haven't seen really a reason for that basis. Right. We haven't seen it anywhere. That is, we don't have a single example of it in any line that, that the seven, that the eighth is one of the seven. It's a repeat of history at the very most. And it can be characterized by each of the seven. So when we deal with the seven churches, which we started at, uh, we know that there is a repeat of history. Have we applied all of the seven churches to our history? Do they all exist at once? And they exist at different times. Yeah, but they all exist in our history as well, because we can be the church of Ephesus. And does the church of Laodicea still exist? Very much. Church of Philadelphia, is it going to come again? Right. Is the Church of Thyatira, is persecution going to rise again? That is, can we take the history of the papacy and say that history will be repeated? So. Agreed. Yeah. So we know that the eighth is not just about another one added on to the seven. It's actually a repeat of history. And that's why it's of the seven. Because we always have seven, but we always have an eighth. That is, what has happened in the past will be repeated. Now, I don't understand the next part here where it says, this is clearly describing a return to power by one of the previous seven. The Bible states these are, king, these are kings, not heads, because the Bible plainly says they are heads, as you call them. So we know that they are heads. They're also kings, and they're also mountains, right? They're all three, because all of them are symbolic. Heads are symbolic, kings are symbolic, mountains are symbolic. And they're symbolic of powers. Now they say also the context of Revelation 17 is about worship, false worship. So we know that this is a counterfeit of the true. Right? John is not rehashing the last seven kings of Judah, they say. But we know that's not what we're doing. What we're doing is he's paralleling all history 
because in the revelation all of the bible comes together and anytime we see seven and we've already established the seven, last seven kings of judah we've already established the first seven kings of persia right we've already established these histories and so we have to accept that revelation 17 is an illustration using that that we can look back at the past to understand because if we didn't have the past could we understand revelation 17 no so we need to understand the past we have to bring all the lines together that's what we've been trying to do now um they say here at the end of their their comments is it not confusion to try and establish that christ is the eighth king of that beastly system described in revelation 17. so they have a misunderstanding about why we were making the parallel with the kings of judah christ is the true eighth the seven heads and the eighth of revelation 17 are a counterfeit of the true Christ is the seed of David. He's descended from these kings. He is the eighth. It's overturned, overturned, overturned until Christ takes up his kingship as the eighth king. It's a symbol of the resurrection. So, so there's a misunderstanding that they have regarding what we're actually saying when we compare the kings of Judah with the kings of Revelation 17. Now, it may be that they're they're trying to force an interpretation, that they might know what, what we're saying, but that they're arguing that if you do this, you are essentially saying that Christ must be the eighth king, which, of course, we wouldn't be saying because this is a counterfeit. So there would be no way that we could be doing that. So, so this last part doesn't make sense, but I think it, it, it could be part of the misunderstanding that goes all the way through the comments. And any final thoughts before we close with prayer? You've given a lot more to think about. Okay, so, and, and we have a lot more to study and to look at, but... Um, Let's, let's now close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the time that we have had here this evening. We're thankful for the Sabbath, for the precious hours of fellowship and rest. We're thankful, Lord, for the completeness that it promises that we can be Christ-like in character, that we can be holy, and we ask that we can keep the Sabbath holy. Help us to reflect upon all the things that you are doing, to study your word, and we also pray, Lord, for this movement, for the trying time that we are in, and we pray for wisdom in the decisions that we make. Thank you for hearing our prayer. And be with each one, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Recording.